Welcome back to another episode of Have Game Will Travel. I'm your host, Bennett Newsom. I'm the esports strategist here at Full Sail University. Uh, but maybe some of you know me as Dammit Bennett on the internet. If this is your first time joining us. Welcome. And if you've watched before, we're happy that you're back. Have Game Will Travel is an interview style show that focuses on how much. Uh, how there's so much more to esports and gaming uh, than just being good at the game. So we kind of take a virtual trip here with our guests through their journey in the industry. If you have questions for our guests, you can type them into chat and we'll pull them up on stream during the show and get those answered for you. But buckle up, have game will travel starts now. I would love to welcome our guest, Kevin Murray uh, from Rare Drop and a ton of other things. So uh, Kevin, how are you today? Welcome. How is it going, man? It's going good, Ben. And how are you, my friend? I am doing fantastic. Well, welcome to the show. Uh, tell the audience a little bit about yourself, who you are, what you do, all, all of the things. So uh, my name is Kevin Murray, as Bennett said. I'm the CEO of Rare Drop. Uh, Rare Drop has a bunch of like tentacle arms and things we're involved in. So we own a coffee company called Kings Coast Coffee. Uh, we run an event called Gaming Community Expo, which I'm an executive producer. Um, we are part in partnership with a, a talent agency in the space called Phoenix Down. Uh, uh, and then uh, Rare Drop's involved in event production, live, virtual. Um, we work with Full Cell all the time yep. and um, uh, marketing, creative, all that fun stuff. So that's kind of the general top down of, of who we are and what we do. Absolutely. You wear a ton of hats. And that's kind of like common in this industry is that you, mm -hmm. you do a lot of things. You diversify. You have your hand in a lot of uh, a lot of different stuff, which is great. So, uh, well, let's let's rewind a little bit. How did you get into gaming? You know, what, what was that kind of first area that got you excited about gaming? Uh, it was when I got my NES as a kid. I don't remember exactly how old I was, but uh, I begged and begged and begged because my <laughs> friends had it, and um, yep. you know, my uh, I opened it on Christmas morning, and you know, I played Mario Brothers till my thumbs hurt. Uh, <laughs> you know, it was on one of those old tvs with the oh, yeah. plug it into the cable and stuff mm -hmm. and you know it just never stopped um i i still try and make time for gaming now because you know as as you probably understand yes. if you don't if you don't really stream anymore and even though you work in the industry people assume you do it all the time it's like well no i i have a big boy job too so i don't get to <laughs> play as much but you know over the years i got involved i was a you know part a raider in world of warcraft yeah. for a while uh, obviously destiny which is where we met yep and uh did that for a while and um yeah that's it was it was very similar to everyone else's journey just loved gaming i used to you know I still to this day love getting in like a franchise mode in Madden and just trying to make like the worst team, the best team in the league yeah. over a couple of years, just stuff like that. It's just, I, I just love gaming. That's awesome. Well, I always talk about the very first game that I like truly fell in love with. And I, you know, I grew up with every console much like you did, but the first game that I ever really like loved was doom. And it just mm. blew my mind. What, what was that first game that you really loved? um well on the note of doom before i go on to that like i remember going to my buddy's house and putting cheat codes in and doom on on the, the they had a pc on the kitchen or the dining room table and we would like look up the cheat codes and stuff and be like oh yeah you know god mode i can do everything but we had to turn it off when mom came home because he was a pastor's kid right. so we'd hide it but it was like the only person i knew that had access to doom so that was That's great awesome. um the game that made me fall in love was probably Link to the Past on SNES. Like okay. I, 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 I probably have spent thousands of hours over the years uh, replaying and playing the game. But the first time I touched it, I didn't know that you could go on a journey like that yeah. in a virtual environment and, you know, have a fully fleshed story and go to different biomes and things like that. So that was like my first big experience. I had played Final Fantasy one on NES, but he didn't. It didn't translate the same way that 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 Link to the Past did. Link to the Past, to me, to this day, it's like Link to the Past is number one, and Night yeah. Republic is is number two. <laughs> it's cool to to really see how like these virtual worlds exist, even all the way back then. You know, like yep. that. It's just such a cool thing. So, um, so for you, I, I feel like, and I know you obviously, and, and we share some similar paths here. Gaming yep. wasn't your first. Uh, like passion was it no uh for the longest time it was music yep. um uh, just again similar to you uh i was in a few bands i was a roadie i was at every show on long island where i grew up um you know knew everybody in that community 
um always going to new york city for shows i i i always tell the story i won't go into detail here but like i was at cbgb's when somebody got stabbed in the leg you know (laughs) so uh uh you know just fun stuff like that over the years and uh, uh that was the first real thing that took hold of me i would say sports before that too like i was really big into baseball and and football and i played a lot uh in in high school but um music just took me and you know i got to see the whole country because of music and you know experience things that a lot of other people wouldn't get to and you know the open road is is an experience in and of itself as you know it is Um, it is very very different than what you may think (laughs) yeah 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 and it's uh uh you know playing for like 300 dollars a night and then that that's gotta last you for gas and you're living off the dollar menu at taco bell and mcdonald's it was it was an experience and uh, uh i'm glad i did it and, you know most most of my friends to this day actually are still from that yeah. that time in my life including pete and wayne who are my partners at king's coast they yep. that's how we met each other so that's awesome uh so you with that passion for for music you received a music business and audio recording degree from five towns uh tell us a, a little bit about what you studied there and, and maybe how that's kind of helped you in your career uh, and, and maybe what lessons kind of carried over from that time in music. Um, I was on the cusp of audio changing over from, from analog to digital. Yep. So the college was actually learning at that time. Five towns was, was in flux. And ironically, I was looking at moving to full sale, which I still find hilarious to this day. Um, but it was just easier to go to school in New York. So yeah. I, I stuck with five towns for a year and then, um, I studied business management and, and uh, uh, application for for another year. And then I kind of decided that it wasn't like college, probably after I got my associates, I wasn't going to go any further because I just I felt the call to go to work. Yeah. And I've always been been a grinder and a hustler. I've, I've always wanted to make money. So at, at my second year of college, um, I was working for my uh, a company that my uncle was like a director of something at, mm-hmm. uh, which was an event planning company in New York City. Um, they had a contract for some of the biggest venues in, in New York City. They had a contract with the city itself. So I was doing all these big parties. I was 19 years old. I had actually started doing like part-time weekends at 15 illegally. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> and um, uh, uh, you know, I had kind of started in a stock room. And by 19, they're like, take this truck downtown, you know, on those tiny little roads through Chinatown to get this box truck at 19 with no commercial license. Right? <laughs> um and, uh, uh, you know, I got to experience that side of stuff and, and the whole event world. And, you know, I, I was going to school Monday through Thursday, Thursday, I would, you know, be at work on Friday. And then the big thing that actually changed everything was 9-11. Um, 9-11 happened in New York and uh, uh, we got the contract to feed all of the emergency service workers all around New York City. Um And that changed my life because all of a sudden I went from working like 15, 20 hours on a weekend to I was going to school full time and pulling a 45 hour weekend from Thursday. I would get up at Friday at like two and be in the in the warehouse by four, you know, driving coffee everywhere to like cops and, and all these emergency service workers. And it was it was great for my wallet it took a lot out of me emotionally because you know it was a really really horrible thing that had happened um but it actually changed my mindset on work and it really taught me to like shut up stop complaining like go get your shit done and and you know keep things moving along and 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 you know work uh there's people that obviously have it worse than you so you know make the most of the time you have for for sure yeah no that's that's incredible um Fast forward a little bit to like what 2014, you started streaming on Twitch. Uh, Yeah, yeah, right on there. Tell us about how you found the platform and and kind of what had gotten you excited about streaming. So I'd been doing, I'd been doing podcasting for a few years before that. Um, Just like I was, you know, streaming on random websites on the the internet, and uh, (laughs) I don't even know what they were called. But uh, you know, I was doing it solo and like you know, playing like disc jockey and talking about music and and whatnot and. Um, my buddy Rob, uh, who would become my co-host at Worst Radio Show, which is what actually started all this right. for me, um, he was like, hey, uh, something with Warcraft, and he wanted to show me something from a raid. So he pulled up, I think it was Towley. I don't even remember. Uh, but he pulled up I th- what I think was Towley and was like, this is, you know, this from the raid. This is how you down this guy. Right. And we were watching, and I was like, wait, so he just plays and people hang out and like talk and it's like a whole and he's like yeah it's like this community thing whatever 
I was like, this is cool. Yeah. So I started watching. <laughs> um, and you know, I would watch people that ended up, I, I work with now and whatnot. And, um, eventually, uh, we decided to start streaming worse radio show, the podcast on Twitch, which then turned into like gaming. We started adding more of our friends to it. Um, and, uh, that's pretty much how we started to go in. That's at that point I had met you yep. and, uh, a f- you know, a few other people that were, were still talk to all the time. And, um, it was the very beginning of destiny. Yeah. So I, I still remember, I, I love saying it, Pete coming to, uh, the company I was working for at the time owned a bar in Queens and Pete got destiny. Uh, how do I phrase this? Um, not from a retail store. Okay. We'll leave it at that. <laughs> and, uh, we had it a day early, even though the servers were not, it was just nice to hold it. And he, right. he handed it to me at the, uh, at the bar. Cause we were obsessed with the beta yeah. and uh, I actually hated the alpha, but we were obsessed with the beta <laughs> and I uh, handed it to me and he was like, here, you know, uh, uh, happy trails. I'll see you tomorrow night, you know, for some, for some, uh, some, uh, what, what were the, what they called dungeons back in the day? I forget. Oh man. Strikes. strikes. Yeah. For yeah, strikes. Yeah. For strikes tomorrow night. So I was like, all right, yeah, let's do this. And I remember him handing it to me and that to me, that's the most pivotal moment of all that. That's when everything changed because yep. Destiny was the rocket that that uh, uh, made everything take off, and uh, that's the community that to this, to this day I still, um, you know, am very thankful for the folks. Even you know, a lot of folks have moved on from that community, right. and you know, they're doing other stuff. But that core community from like 2015, uh, that that's some of my favorite people in this Absolutely. entire industry. Yeah, it's funny because Destiny has come up a couple times on the show, and and uh, you know, it's it's always interesting to hear people's. Um, kind of first steps into that like you and so mm-hmm. uh you know the game grabs people in different ways especially early on like it did back then and uh and, you know for myself i know i w- i wasn't even paying attention i remember getting announced at e3 and i was like ah, i've you know i played halo i'm fine and then like <laughs> they sent me a code uh for the alpha and beta and i, I was like how how have i not been playing it? like why this game's awesome and so like yep. it just hooks you you know which is really funny so uh that's great but uh obviously with with uh, a ton of high profile Twitch streamers leaving uh, Twitch to go to YouTube and uh, other platforms. Uh, you obviously had some experience uh, in exclusive streaming deals. You signed with, mm-hmm. unfortunately, the now defunct Mixer um, after being a Twitch partner in 2018. Can you give us some insight in in that journey and, and what that was like as a, as a creator? Yeah, so at the time, um, uh, Mixer was new and fresh and I remember it uh uh when it was whatever it was called before i forget uh but you know all the other sites like they're gone now like hitbox and all those crazy Mm -hmm. ones i'd always poke around those and see what was going on because you never know what would happen so um uh beam that's what it was called and uh uh what happened was i um at the time someone that was working with us decided to make an introduction to someone at at microsoft and i kind of got passed around a little bit and uh eventually they're like hey you know we're trying to bring folks from your community over to to mixer would you be interested in being a part of that and i said sure so the deal was kind of like you come over you have ex- an ex- exclusivity deal uh and it was it was wonderful cuz i was getting paid you know a nice chunk of change yeah. to do what i was doing on twitch anyway so it, it allowed me to go full time for the first time and um my my role there was a to be like a community leader um uh for variety actually it wasn't even in destiny at the time um they wanted me to push into variety which i was more yeah. than happy to do and uh and b was to try and you know bring folks over from twitch to mixer that was the the goal um and to do it organically not yeah. like sit there and try and craft deals or anything it was just like hey i'm having a great time this is great would you be interested in talking with them that was kind of the handshake agreement yep. so I was with them um, for a little over, uh, not a little over, about a year and a half, a little bit more than that. And um, I really enjoyed the first, I would say, nine months of my time there. I thought, you know, this is this is a great platform. They're making some innovative moves. They're, they're really doing some cool stuff that I think Twitch is either afraid to do or just not going to do. Mm-hmm. And the vibe there was great, too, because I went to PAX South and I got to meet. They sat me down with all the devs and stuff. And they're like, what's wrong with the platform? What's yeah. good about it? And I was like, oh, my God, my opinion. It's value. This is nuts. <laughs> and um, it was a little bit after that where things started to go downhill. 
And I remember by GCX 2018, I was telling everyone, I was like, I'm probably leaving. <laughs> yeah. <'Cause, laughs> um, I feel like they've lost their way and I feel like they're not making the right decisions anymore. And it was, everyone started at first. People were like, you're a little crazy. I don't think that's right. And I was like, mm, we'll wait till, you know, yeah, wait till you'll, stuff rolls you'll out. See. <laughs> Until stuff rolls out. So by, I would say like August of that year, I started getting very vocal on Mixer yeah. <laughs> about how bad things were. And then like a week later, they signed Ninja and nothing against Ninja. Cause if I was Ninja, I would take the damn Absolutely. deal. I'm like, yeah, like, dude, go get your, get your bag and take it. So, um, it really just turned into me. It was no longer a sustainable place for a yeah. medium to size to, to small, uh, broadcaster. And, um, I made the difficult decision to leave. Uh, I delayed it uh, actually by three months because my partner at the time had just signed a, a contract with Mixer. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, in favor of, of not messing things up for him, I stayed three months longer than I wanted to. Yeah. Um, and uh, I believe it was, it was, yeah, it was around Thanksgiving because I, I remember I did my final stream on Mixer before Thanksgiving and then I jumped back to Twitch. And then, you know, that uh, COVID hit right after that. And uh, I said, this really is not what I should be doing. Um, and when COVID hit rare drop, went into scramble mode to try and save GCX and see what we could do. And then all of a sudden we kind of reformed the business and started picking up all this client work, yeah. um, you know, in our space. And that's what I was like, I need to, I can't stream anymore. So yeah. that was kind of the, the things were great. And then it was like, it's just not doing it for me. So mm -hmm. I need to move on to, to the next phase of my career. Yeah. And that's, and that's really cool because I think. The, those doors opened up, you know, mm -hmm. um, there was so much opportunity for you guys. And um, I, you know, I think back to the the first time that we actually met in person was in Tampa at an ale house, which ale is house. now now referred to as a uh, uh, sweat fest. Um, just it's also it was, a FedEx store now, by the way, know, it's a FedEx store. OK, cool. Yes. <laughs> nice. Uh, so t tell the audience a little bit about um, why this was kind of a significant piece of, of history, this event that happened at this ale house. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, at the time, the the uh, Gathalian and Professor Broman were at the top of the directory, and yep. they they just they owned a uh, 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 destiny from a from a sense. I wouldn't say they owned; they were like shepherds of the community. That's right. the way I always viewed them, because um, they were very generous and and Absolutely. giving back to everyone that was involved. I, I mean, I don't think things get as good as they did for a lot of people without the two of them. Absolutely. Um, and they just wanted to celebrate that. Um, and I had met Goth at Disney a few months before that. So we hit it off and, um, you know, he told me about this thing that they were planning and then he announced it to the public and I was like, oh, cool. This will be fun. You know, get to hang out, with, you know, a bunch of people. And I'm thinking it's like people from Florida, right? Like, no one's going to be as stupid as me and fly down. Why would they do that? And all of a sudden, all the content creators on Twitch and YouTube are like, yeah, I'm coming. Yeah, I'll be there. And it's like, what? And then all of a sudden, all these people are coming in chat like, yeah, I'm coming from England and I'm coming from California. And I'm like, oh, this is this is big. Yeah. And then, you know, as well as I do, you walked into that bar and you're like, there's too many people in here. <laughs> <laughs> there's people like having dinner as a family. And we're just like, hanging yeah. out. like what is yeah. happening here? <laughs> and then we we moved the party. We tried to go to Cigar City. They wouldn't let us in because we had too many people. And then we ended up at that Irish place. Um, but it kind of changed the game because it, I think it was one of the first times that a community had come out of Twitch like that. And I'm not going to say it was the first time. I'm going to say it was one of the, because I know somebody will come along and be like, but this, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and really it was, it was, it was by creators for creators. And it was, you know, for the, the communities that they've built collectively and separately to come together and celebrate that. That's all it was. It was a big yeah. party. And, um, uh, it, it, it snowballed into what we have as GCX today. And it was super poignant to me because it was the pivotal pivotal moment where i had met everyone and then ironically and this is this is happening parallel to this uh my wife uh was offered her parents are from here yeah. i'm from long island she's originally from long island which is how we know each other but her parents moved here and then she moved back to go to school we got married and then um we were very i was not happy at my job in new york um i was making a ton of money and i was just absolutely miserable i had no quality of life um so she looked into getting a job here and she actually found one that um we, they called her the unicorn because she's one of the few people that can do architecture and interior design um so they hired her we were she was making enough that we were able to move come down and this yep. was after the, that meetup yep uh just a few months after 
and uh, we took a risk. And, yeah. you know, I, I, I started working for my in-laws actually in the building I'm in right now. Um, and now we rent the whole top floor yep. from them. Um, and uh, uh, I tried the streaming thing and that's what led to everything we discussed before. So for me, it was a moment where I was like, okay, if we move, at least I have some friends that, you know, I can get some drinks with and yep. go out and it became so much more. <laughs> Yeah. And that's, I mean, that's honestly kind of what kicked off, um, you know, not only GCX and the other names that's been named, but also Rare Drop. And, and I think that's yep. really cool. Can you talk to us a, a little bit briefly about what Rare Drop is and, and what the mm -hmm. goals were at that time? Yeah. So um, after the first Destiny Community Con, which was in 2016, uh, so the year after the bar meetup, um, we, we had decided um that we wanted to put some good back into the event so ben came up with this whole plan to kind of take take a page out of uh, uh gd um gdq's book and create a, a an online fundraiser yeah. and we were gonna at the time we were gonna focus on the destiny community and pull from there uh so we picked a a a, a nonprofit that we all agreed was you know obviously a worthy cause which ended up being saint jude children's research hospital um, and my sister-in-law's roommate, uh, at the time was running, uh, stuff down here in Tampa. And, um, I had coffee with her and I was like, Hey, we're going to set up this fundraiser. Could you help me, you know, do that? And she was like, yeah, of course. And she would come to me later and be like, I thought you were talking about like five or $10,000. Kevin, I did not <laughs> realize you meant you were going to raise $564,000. Right. And I remember hitting the first hundred thousand. And Ben going, we're going to hit half a million. And I'm like, crazy. Yeah, yeah there's no money. way. It's not going to happen. <laughs> and then we hit half a million. I got to eat crow to him because like I was wrong. And I'm more than happy to be wrong <laughs> yeah, right? in that scenario. Um, and, uh, you know, all of a sudden we had this successful fundraiser. We had this successful event. We get on the phone with St. Jude a few weeks after, which uh, Zach Witten was yep. the person on the phone with a few other folks that, that are, I don't think they're there. They moved to other departments. And uh, they were like, we don't know who you are because Ben had ripped the PayPal link off of their website. And that's how he had set up the alerts and Nightbot for the whole right. thing. <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, Twas built out all the alert systems and whatnot. And then uh, all of a sudden they're like, all of this money just started flooding into our PayPal. And we were like, what the heck's going on? <laughs> so um, they ended up uh, saying, you know, if you'd like to partner and, you know, have a more official relationship so we can do more of this in the future, we would love to do that. But you need a company. You can't just, we can't just be three guys in, in Tampa that are, are, are starting this. So, um, we started rare drop, um, you know, uh, uh Goth came up with the name at the bar one night and, uh, we were like, yes, that's the name that yeah. makes sense. It's, it's just, perfect. you know, if you don't know what rare drop is, it refers to an item in a game that this does has like, I think it's less than a 1% drop rate. Um, so it's a, it's a special item. It's something that's unique. It's something that, um, not everyone in that game has because you know it's it's that very small drop rate so um we at the time we were like maybe we could do stuff with like copyrighted music because that was big with like a uh, 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 monster cat and mm -hmm. you know all those other services and later pretzel and a bunch of other companies would get into that so we're looking at that but at the time we just chose to focus on the event and build the event and we said other things will come as we go along and that's pretty much what it turned into was just funneling all of our energy into building GCX to be what it is today. Right. Um, yeah. So that, that's kind of the, the quick version of <laughs> what it, what it is, what it is now yes. is a completely different animal, but that's, that was it for, I would say till, uh, till COVID hit, to yeah. be honest. Well, let's talk about that. The evolution of it. So destiny con, then it mm -hmm. became guarding con, then it became for, gaming for legal. For legal reasons, <laughs> for for legal, talk to talk to us about the kind of the evolution of the, of the convention. So, Destiny Community Con was supposed to be a Destiny fan con. That was the idea that you know, and we had big aspirations and dreams that Bungie would come alongside of us and embrace us, and you know, they would just be a part of it. And um, you know, they didn't like the name. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's the best way I can put that. Yeah. And. And before I say anything else, we have a phenomenal relationship with Bungie to this day. Um, stay tuned to GCX. That's all I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and they've been very supportive of our event. But all they wanted us to do was change the name because for obvious reasons, that's their intellectual for property, sure. not ours. 
And, um, you know, people were mad about it at first. I never got mad about it. Yeah. Uh, I, I understand how the world works. So we went with Guardian Con and Guardian Con was supposed to represent a few different things. Guardian Con was the idea of what we were doing in the charitable space. Yep. Um, you know, and, and also obviously your character destiny is a guardian, but guardian takes on many different connotations. Many games have guardians, halo, Lord of the Rings online. Um, so we thought it was a nice generic term as we got more down the road and we started, you know, working with 2k on borderlands and we did stuff with division and warframe and realm Royale. And, you know, the list goes on about all these games, Fortnite, uh, all these games that we ended up working with. We were like, it's not about destiny. And we kind of need to break that off yeah. because destiny will always be the core and the part of it. And, you know, the, the heart, but it has arms, legs and a head and eyes and all that stuff now. So it needs to have different representation. So um, we spent about four months on game GCX gaming community expo and figuring out what it looked like, what it would sound like, how it would feel. And we were terrified of the reaction, honestly, in 2019, but like it was like a standing ovation yeah. to, to the change and the celebration. And I think the name now accurately represents what it is. I mean, if you're coming this year, you're going you're gonna to see different stuff. Post-COVID event world is yeah. not the same as it was before, but I don't think the heart of a community is going to go away. I think it's going to feel different and maybe look a little different than you're used to. But I feel like you're really going to jump right back into where you were with your friends and your clan mates and all that stuff. So um, getting to where we are today in that COVID gap was rough. Yeah. That was that was that that situation was harder than building the first event on a on a shoestring budget. Yeah. Um, you know, and um, in 2019, we left that place thinking we'll be back here next year. Mm -hmm. It's going to be bigger than better than ever. You know. We were approaching numbers that could rival pack south at the time um and we were excited about that yeah. and um you know 2020 we didn't have we we did the charity marathon we we muscled up we got through it we managed to uh you know uh, uh get through that it was very difficult but we made it happen and it was rough and then in 2021 we tested the waters with a virtual event and um got completely screwed by our our partner on that one yeah it was unfortunate um, yeah the idea was there and the framework was there and you know i haven't said this publicly so exclusive um <laughs> and the one thing i will say is that if they had come to us and said we need another two months to to build this out which is what they told us during the event mm -hmm. um we would have said okay that's not a problem it's a virtual event yeah so it would have just been delayed two months and i don't think anyone would have cared um, but instead they tried to pull the wool over our eyes and, you know, hide some stuff. Uh, and that's all I can say. Yep. Um, and, uh, but we powered through it. The community rallied around us, which was probably my favorite part. Um, you know, they're like, we don't blame you for this. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, if you saw the public statement that the uh, company made, then you understand what I'm saying. But, yep. um, then our eyes turned to this year. And we watched the world very carefully as things would change. And we we're like, how do we handle COVID in, in, in this event world? Um, you know, and people have their own opinions about it and whatnot, but events are back yeah. and they're, they're happening. So, you know, if that's our business and that's what we're involved in, then we need to continue that while trying to remain as safe as possible. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we've had people come to us and be like, I can't come this year. Like it's, it's just not in the cards. And I go, totally fine. I respect your opinion to do that and you stay home and you stay safe you understand yeah. me i'll see you next year i have no problem with folks who can't make it that's yeah. i completely understandable but i'm sh i'm actually shocked at the reception of the amount of people that do want to be there um i would say we're probably uh around in, in, on target for about 70 to 80 percent of what we had in 2019 that's awesome which is above my prediction in january so um you know, it's going to be exciting. The floor footprint is very different. We actually have more vendors, but we have less large booths. Okay, cool. So it might look smaller, but it's actually more uh, uh, things for you to do. Um, and there's more interactive stuff than we've ever had. Um, so, you know, there's there's going to be announcements on some of the activities you can do. Some are gaming traditional, some are non-gaming, um, but it's just going to be a fun experience. And our goal, again, is to raise a, a buttload of money yep. for the kids at St. Jude and to foster the community and have them come back together. And, you know, whether it's virtually on online through the streams or it, it is in person, that is our goals. We just want to bring everyone together to have a good time, enjoy each other's company. Um, and, and uh, you know, we, we had announced a cruise for 2023. We decided to push it back to 2024 
but that's the way GCX is heading where we're going to do um, micro events and really try and push the envelope of celebrating community and having yeah. fun. We don't want to be packs. We don't want to be dream hack. We don't want to be any of those events. We want our event to have its own special flair that revolves around community that revolves around, you know, doing yeah. charitable activations and revolves around just like that togetherness that we all desire and have missed now for about two and a half years. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, you mentioned it in uh, kind of the evolution there, but uh, every year before uh, GCX, there's a charity marathon that's streamed on mm -hmm. Twitch and collectively over uh, the last six years, you guys have come together to raise uh, just over $17 million in gaming events and marathons like that is huge uh talk to us a little bit about kind of that experience and and how that all came together and and just some of the maybe your favorite moments over the last six years from that stream yeah i i, I think uh the, the charitable aspect of it that's ben's baby by the way i'm the main of i'm the the main event and yeah. the, the physical event ben is is drives the uh, uh the charitable side of and that's of professor broman for everyone that professor doesn't know broman ben. And this year, Sam Lupo came into the fold yep. as the charity director. So Ben has moved to strategy officer at Rare Drop, um, and and Sam has kind of taken over the entire charitable operation. So this is the first year that if you're going to thank anyone for how the marathon turns out, you want to thank Mrs. Dr. Lupo on, yeah. on Twitter because she has done a phenomenal yeah. job putting this together. And her heart and her passion for this is is unparalleled. I don't think I've ever met someone that has feel so strongly um, and that as a couple, because Ben Lupo is the same way. So um, I'm really, really over the moon to have them in our corner and have them, you know, uh, be a part of this. But, you know, we started with that half a million dollars. We I think I, I can never remember the numbers now. It's been so many years. Yeah. But over the years, incrementally, it would just rise and rise and rise. And I, I was always amazed. I was like, wow. And then in 2021, I think we flattened out to a position where uh, we weren't going up anymore there's economic factors and yeah. all sorts of things you can go into there. But at the same time, you know, uh, you can't just, you can't, not everyone's just going to keep moving like a <laughs> rocket up into the right. sky, but it does encourage us to try new things and to go out and see what else we can do in the charitable space. And we, at rare drop, we work with a lot of other nonprofits and try and teach them how to use the space. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to St. Jude, they're the benchmark. They're the ones that we test everything with because we have that ability to do it. As they are one of they're such a good partner and they they treat us so well um that we have that autonomy to kind of like yeah. play with it and try new things and, and do different things and see what works and the biggest takeaway from from where we're where we were in 2016 and where we are now is the industry has changed and that has affected charitable fundraising um so you know i believe we're one of the last entities that can have this big marathon on the scale um you know gdq is another one um uh yogs cast there's a few that you know you'll see but i think the way fundraising is working uh is changing and you know that's where we we look at partners like full sail and we say you know we want to bring you to full sail and run a for-profit event that benefits a nonprofit. yeah and people always look at me like what are you talking about i'm like that's the future sponsorships you know esports events that's where this is going to go because that's where the non-endemic brands that are looking at the space and have been looking since 2020 when we all got locked inside and Twitch all of a sudden <laughs> became this valuable commodity. Right. Um, they all looked at this and they're like, okay, how do I make money off of this? And, you know, some of it was like, I'm going to try this and it didn't work, but there are still brands that are staring at our space. Like, how do, how do I benefit from this? Mm -hmm. So part of the other part of Rare Drops business is teaching these non-endemics. Like, this is how you use the space effectively. This is how you get in there and you... Um, it's, you are authentic and organic. You're not. Right. Uh, uh, you're not Coke gaming. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we are really trying to uh, uh, take the charitable side and and teach folks how they can run it as a for profit entity that benefits a nonprofit. I know that's like a jumbled, like really crazy path to take, but we do like that's why we always talk to partners about about full sale and and our and the fortress because it's easy to do something with a partner who like you who's willing to like go the extra mile and you know oh you're bringing in a nonprofit. well we're going to roll out the red carpet on top of that and do all of these extra things to make sure that you achieve your, your goals um on a revenue side so um we have an event next year i can't really talk about the details um 
that we're producing in Las Vegas um, with with uh, a nonprofit and some really cool entities. And there's a few other ones trickled throughout the year, but that's kind of the future of, of how it's going to go. And I think GCX will always remain a marathon fundraiser, but I'm mm-hmm. interested, to see, interested to see as the years go on, working with uh, the Lupos and, and Ben, Professor Broman, how we're going to angle things, you know, taking the for-profit model, whatever's on the next horizon. One of the big things now is TikTok. TikTok yep. for fundraising is completely untapped. Tiltify just got on TikTok and it's, it's, it's a mess. Like you can only feed into one general fundraiser. You can't do your own on your own channel. So as the technology develops and as TikTok, because TikTok's embracing it. Yeah. We, we, we have conversations with TikTok about fundraising all the time. TikTok's embracing it. It's just a matter of the tech catching up with the want and the need to do it. So I think that's going to change the game over the next few years. I yeah. think GCX is going to be able to raise more money for St. Jude because of things like this. And then I think you're also going to see nonprofits pivot and everyone's going to stop trying to get their own marathon because that's what everyone's still mm-hmm. trying to do. Yep. And they're going to start pivoting to things that actually work and and have low overhead. That's the key. You can't, you know, you're not going to you're not going to spend a quarter of a million dollars to try and raise 300,000. That's where they fall into a trap <laughs> right. a lot of time. So you have to find ways for them to do effective spending mm-hmm. um, and, and get things done. Uh, we we look at it most most charitable events, not online, are a one or two to one spend. Meaning, if I spend fifty k, I'm going to get a hundred k. This this you know this run this jogathon or whatever. Um, in the gaming space, the spends look to be anywhere from from six to one to eight to one. So it's very profitable when done correctly. The yeah. problem is you have to spend five years building it if you're going to do marathons yep. and community and stuff like that. So it's a challenging environment. And I think GCX is one of the, that we're fortunate to be right place, right time and build what we built. Mm-hmm. And um, again, I'm interested to see as we play with new stuff, where it all leads and how it all ends up. Yeah. And, and I mean, obviously choosing like a place like St. Jude in, like that being the main focus of a lot of these events, that's that's a huge impact for so many people. Um, I, I've obviously been able to go with you to uh, to St. Jude and, and tour and, and meet the families and talk to the parents and play games with the kids, which was such an incredible experience. I would love yeah. for you to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of the impact of what you guys have done over the last six years. So I, I went to St. Jude uh, for the first, I think you were there my yep. first time. I think that was our first time. Uh, I've been three times since, um, for, uh, I've been for an award show. I went for, uh, two of the summits and once for another trip for uh, business stuff. And I always like to go to the hospital with somebody new because I want to see their reaction because I remember the first time I went and I still tell stories from that because of the impact it had on me. Um, you know, the macaroni and cheese story, you know, and, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the prom stories and my biggest takeaway and what impacts me the most about St. Jude is, is this, I have three kids. Um, so St. Jude's goal is not necessarily, we're going to cure your cancer. Mm-hmm. Obviously they're going to do that. What comes along with that when you're, when you're donating, their goal is to not disrupt quality of life. And if you say that out loud, it sounds so lofty because you're dealing with a child who's fighting a life-threatening disease. So if their goal is to bring quality of life or not disrupt quality of life, how do they do that? That means St. Jude is in touch with their school to make sure their curriculum is all caught up. That means that they're, uh, if they're older, they're trying to teach them job skills and things like that. If, if uh, like we said, the prom, that means that there's a senior prom for kids at St. Jude where Estee freaking Lauder comes in and does all the makeup and Vera Wang comes in and puts the dresses and men's warehouse does the tuxedos all donated, but your money provides the the avenues to make those deals and get that done. So, um, I mean, with $17 million, we have literally as a community, I'm not saying we rare drop. I'm saying the community has run St. Jude for multiple days. That's a big freaking deal. Yeah. So, um, we're, we're very proud of that stat. And the biggest one um, that I'm really enjoying for this year is that St. Jude went into Ukraine and Poland and kids that were in children's hospitals on the other side of the world are now being treated and their their uh, treatment was not disrupted because of a war. Yeah. 
on, on, and there it's, it's, it's insane. Like when you think of mounting that type of effort and what it would cost, um, and St. Jude's doing more stuff like that all over the world. Uh, and they're, they're, they're branching out of being, you know, a charity in the United States. Uh, and, and, and Danny Thomas's dream is being realized yeah. because you you're there with when they bust out those statistics of the, the, the rates of kids being cured back in the day were like, depending on, on what form of cancer and whatnot, it was like four to 20%. We're above 80% on yeah. some of these 90%. So it's working. It's just, it's a long ass haul and we got to yep. keep, got to keep grinding. Yep. Absolutely. And it, it's incredible, you know, what, what the hospital does. I mean, it just it it's really, amazing. really blows your mind and, and being there and experiencing it is, is, is a life changing thing for sure. Um, yeah. It, but, uh, you know, bringing back, bringing it back to, to GCX, you're now the executive producer. Uh, what does this role entail and, and how have the other positions that you've had and, and, and supported kind of what you're doing now? So, um, you know, I start as event director on the floor dealing, you know, with stuff very hands on. Yeah. Um, my role now is really, you know, uh, budgets, p &L, um, a lot of, of uh, overseeing, checking off on floor plan and things like that. Um, I'm not in the nitty gritty. I try to stay out of the conversations and people will ask me why, like what, what, what changed? It's like, well, I'm trying to grow another side of the business on yeah. rare drop and it's very difficult to work multiple jobs as it is. So with that being said, I kind of need to take a step back and I can't be the boots on the ground when it comes to GCX, which, which is very difficult for me because <laughs> I am a very hands-on person. Um, you know, and if somebody doesn't do it the, the, the right way, air quotes, right. Uh, then, you know, I'm like, ah, oh. so, uh, I actually have a, a mentor now here in Tampa, um, uh, that, uh, really she showed me how i need to approach this from multiple angles and she's she's now taught me you know you need to let them have the reins and do this yeah. but you need to set your expectations appropriately um and make sure they understand what's most important to you so she had me write down the five most important things to me uh for gcx and and what those are and bring them to the team and i was petrified writing this email because <laughs> But I ended it with with something that I just kind of wrote out and I was like, oh, that that's actually she got that out of me without even trying, which was like my wants should not affect the outcome of the event. The market and the community should be what affects, you know, the right. event itself and what it looks like and how it's shaped and formed. Uh, and, you know, when I wrote that, I was like, that's the key. That's what I've been missing is everyone. Everyone that works at Rare Drop thinks it's like, oh, we need to do what Kevin wants for the event. <laughs> and it's not about what I want. It's about what the community wants and it's about what the market is dictating. Those are the two most important things that we need to be on top of and, and, and be ahead of. So that's kind of how I changed from, you know, the, the, the director role to the producer role. Um, you know, I was in a meeting today and three weeks before the event, they're like, oh, floor plans got to change again, which is like, you know, <laughs> fire marshal's going to stab right. me in the throat at some point. Uh, but those are the things they have to bring to me is like, Floor plan is going to change again. We have to move X, Y, and Z because of these wires and blah, 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 blah. How do we do that? And, you know, I'm, I, I have no artistic ability whatsoever, but I'm scribbling on my iPad with, you know, misshapen squares and stuff like move this here, move this here, move, do this, do this, do this. So um, I'm hoping as time goes on and as the event becomes more successful, it really, uh, uh, it really just becomes like a top level thing for me where I can kind of float it in and out and really concentrate on rare drop because rare drop is the thing right now that we're really trying to to push really on king's coast uh push really hard um on on, on business development in in product development in a sense on some things so um gcx i, I will never say it's going to run itself because it doesn't that's not how an event works but you just want the right people in the right place at the right time to do and execute based on you know your your what you think is successful your benchmarks of success not necessarily what you want for it if that makes sense Oh, for sure. And I mean, that's a ton of responsibility. And then you add on top of that rare drop, you know, what does the CEO of rare drop do? Like, what is like, <laughs> what's your day to day there? Plus we do talk shows stuff. like this. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> and Mindy texted me while I was, our CEO texted me while I was doing, she's like, I'm so happy to see you doing CEO stuff. Um, uh, and again, when I had, when I sat down with the mentor for the first time, I said, that's my struggle is like, I have one foot you know, still over here and the other foot over here. And I don't know how to manage that. And uh, it comes down to letting go. Like yeah. you have to trust in the process and the team at some point. And that's difficult for me because I've always been so hands-on. Yeah. Um, but 
basically, I'm, I'm crafting the vision for the company and, you know, gauging initiatives that we get involved in. Um, I'm, I'm in, in a lot of client meetings when it comes to, um, you know, crafting something globally for them. When it comes to the, the nuts and bolts, I kind of step out and let the experts on those, those various areas that they're working on at the time deal with it. You know, if it's design, we have design folks that we work with. If it's animation and, right. and editing, we, we push it to those folks. I don't jump in those because I'll just sit there and stare and be like, I have words. I don't understand marketing. That's my, th if, when I get a marketing meeting and they start saying acronyms and stuff and I'm like, I'm going to Google that. I yeah. <laughs> don't know what that one means. What does it um, mean? <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it's over my head, but like ops and finances, like I hate finances, but that's what I'm good at. Yeah. So um, it's, it's, it's mostly uh, uh, I joke. It's, it's being a giant babysitter, um, but you're, you're, you're babysitting like various disciplines of a department to make sure that they're all gelling together and making sure that the final product that leaves yeah. the door is cohesive and was, you know, everyone touched it in their way, made yeah. it better. And then, and, and then shoved it out the door. And then it's, you know, following leads and, 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 you know, negotiating, I'm working on three partnerships for various things right now. And, you know, negotiating back and forth on behalf of, of our team to see what's going to work there. Uh, so yeah, that's the CEO. And then I have Kings Coast where I'm CFO, but yep. I've kind of been in that area. I've kind of been regulated to anything involving money yep. um, and making sure that, you know, uh, 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 the New York warehouse doesn't uh, overextend themselves when they're like, hey, we got this this new. Uh, I'm sure you've seen the, the single shot roaster that Wayne yep. bought, the pink one that mm -hmm. we had at the Coffee Expo. I'm like, how much did you spend on that? <laughs> How much did you spend on that? <laughs> Gotta keep like, them well, in line, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, we're we're doing it. so. Yeah, it's it's basically that. Um, and I'm up there like once a quarter to make sure that you know they didn't burn the place down. Yeah. Um, uh, I'll be. I think I'm going up in in and I think like two weeks after GCX, I'm going to New York for uh, my weekly check in. Wayne always writes on the whiteboard there. He's like must wear pants, CFO. Kind of. <laughs> Uh, I, if you haven't checked out uh, Kings Coast Coffee, definitely definitely give it a whirl. Uh, great stuff and. Um, obviously from like a rare drop perspective, you know, at full sale, we, you mentioned it here, we've worked on a few different activations together, including mm -hmm. probably one of my favorite because I'm a huge Tampa Bay lightning fan. Uh, they, we've done the, <laughs> the shell challenge here, uh, t twice now, uh, which is great in the fortress. And, um, we've, uh, we've participated in, uh, one of the GCX charity marathons. Um, what do you see as like the next significant direction for rare drop? If you can tell us, obviously, I know yeah, no. stuff you can't talk about. One of the big pushes we're doing, and this lines up with with you, and you know this already, so I'm just talking to the audience, is um, I'm a firm believer that esports um, jumped way too far ahead of itself. Um, out of the gate, esports was like, we're the NFL and we're going to act <laughs> like it. And I'm like, no, you're not. The NFL has been around for, for a very long time. I think like 80 years or something. Right. Um, and, and, and it didn't do this overnight. And, you know, just cause you have a lot of viewers on Twitch doesn't mean you can fill out a sports arena. It's, it's, that's not Next how time. it works. So we, we really spent a lot of, of the, um, lockdown period and, you know, pre getting back to events, trying to really look at esports from a holistic view and say, how do we fix the problem that a lot of orgs and a lot of, uh, uh, tournaments and entities are having, which is like, they think they're too big for their britches and they want this like insane production value and, but they don't want to pay for it. They mm -hmm. want like everything handed to them on a platter. Obviously they have to pay for it at some point, but we look at companies like WWE and UFC who are running very small studio events that are televised. So, you know, because WWE used to be at full sale and I heard a rumor they're coming back. Is that Maybe true? we'll see. Um, and uh, uh, they filmed their NXT show there and NXT is done in a room. How, how many people are seated in there? Do you know off the top of your head? Um, it's surprising because they turn, they, they transform the, the live venue at full sale. Um, it's a, I want to say it's a couple hundred. Yeah, but, but it's not like a, it's not like five thousand people. It's correct. Just like yeah, maybe five hundred. Yeah. So it looks like that on camera, which is cool. But right, it, it's Be much smaller than you than you think. But the production value is insane. Like the LED lights they use, the screens they've built. Like it's just it's it's amazing and it's it's a great watch. UFC has the same thing in Vegas. 
Um, I think their studio holds about 200 to 250 people and it's, it's televised on ESPN, great lighting, great screens, led the whole nine yards. So I think esports needs to start shifting its focus into stuff like that. Yeah. And it needs to understand that it is not this, it is this. And I think focusing on capturing your audience that you do have online, but providing them this amazing, amazing experience for the viewer, just like we've done with shell challenge is what esports should be doing and how it should be acting. It needs to stop trying to fill these arenas. And then, you know, I'm, I'm very in tune with the city of Tampa. Um, I have, I have, uh, 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 when, when it comes to the, the, the government of, of the city, um, anything that's esports is an email to me. Yeah. Um, you know, they were very upset when GCX left Tampa to go to Orlando. <laughs> I'm sure they um, were. But like, I was very pleased personally, but uh, I know you were. And, you know, I, I it is like, could we come back? It's like, yeah, just, you know, what, what are you going to do for GCX to make me come back, yeah. Tampa? Um, but, uh, uh, you know, anything esports that comes through here gets sent to me. And, you know, these events, they come in, they're like, we want to rent Raymond James Stadium. We're expecting 3000 people. I mean, James Stadium holds like, I don't even know, but a lot of yeah. 40, 50,000 people. Yeah. So it's like, why would you do that? Because you know the, the price to rent Raymond James is through the roof. Yeah. And then for your esports event, you're going to have to bring in production that's like, honest to God, so expensive and ridiculous that it wouldn't make sense. Why aren't you going to a full sale? Why aren't you going to a diamond view? Why aren't you yeah. going to places like that where you can produce that? So we try and be that middle person mm -hmm. that can get them from there to there and then help them with the creative involved in it. And that's, you know, that's what we've done with you with, with yeah. bolts is, is all right, this is what we want to do. This is what we, you know, and the best thing about working at, at, at full sale in the fortress is the students get to just like create and be and that's yeah. why we try not stand in the way for those for when we work with you with diamond view we're a little bit more like hands-on and you know getting in there with with y'all we're like let them learn let yeah. them figure it out let get them see experience. how it works yeah 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 and that's my favorite part is you know when you, you we were laughing last time when i was doing dress rehearsal and stood in for cheese <laughs> And uh, the 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 lovely girl that she was like, this is my first time miking someone up. And yeah. I was like, I feel special. <laughs> it's awesome. So it, yeah, it's just it's 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 an awesome experience going there. But that's what esports should be doing, and that's one of the major initiatives um, that Rare Drop is is pushing for um, is getting esports, um, not necessarily teams, events, whatever it may be, whoever wants to put something on into these studios teaching them this is how you should be marketing it this is how right. your creative should look you know this is what the industry standard is right now and this is your this is how you save a buttload of money yep. like you do have to spend money but like you, you don't have to rent you know the, the staples center in la whatever that's yeah. called now and some crypto company has it but you can do these highly produced things they're on network television and some of the biggest companies in the world that's how they're operating look at look at um xfl they announced today they signed a deal with disney to do Disney Plus, so they'll be the first sport on Disney Plus. That's crazy. ABC, ESPN, um, uh, USFL. I'm, I don't know how familiar you are with them, but they're they watched the the what was the AAF or whatever it was mm -hmm. pre COVID um, fail. They didn't even make it through their season. So what the USFL do? They said we're going to do a test season, and every team's going to play in Birmingham, Alabama, at the same stadium. Um, that way, there's no travel costs, there's no stadium rentals, yeah. none of that. And they killed their overhead to make sure that the idea was sound and to make sure it works. And that's what esports teams really need to start getting into. I think Overwatch League blew everyone's ego up and was like, look at what we can do. Guess what? Most of the owners that bought into Overwatch League either sold or want out. Yep. And that's where we're at right now. Yep. There's a lot of money. And, you know, I think that's a, a good kind of segue to like the content side of things because mm -hmm. there's so much. A value in that you know and then it's that it's more than just you know the pro team and this but when you can then build content and do all of these other things around it you create a lot more avenues uh speaking of obviously rare drop has a ton of content you know you mentioned before you do podcasting and and that was a, kind of how you got your start in in the streaming space um talk uh, talk a little bit about what uh rare, do, uh, rare drop does in the content sector yeah, I mean, we love to create videos and a lot of it is experimental. Um, Tim and I have a, a podcast specifically for Star Wars called Star Wars and Scotch. Um, it's the most popular thing on Rare Drop, shockingly, because <laughs> Tim and I, Tim and I, when we started it, we were worried there wasn't enough Star Wars stuff to talk about every week. Boy, were we wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
we can't get to stuff most weeks. Um, and now we're kind of introducing ourselves to the broader Star Wars community, very similar to the way we did with Destiny back in the day. Um, and we're starting to meet some great people. I couldn't go to Celebration next week because it's my anniversary. I'm really upset about that. But my wife, I, I pitched this whole thing, Bennett, I to go out to Anaheim. And I was going. And then she was like, wait a minute. I have to go to your nerd convention. Then you want to go see Avengers Campus. And then three weeks later, we got to go to the other nerd convention. Mm, it's our anniversary. Yeah. It's like, fine, babe. I'll stay home. And now, you know, um, but going out there and fostering relationship we got comics with matt and frank on our network discussing awesome. all things comics it's great there's just we have something for for everyone that's kind of the way and we want to expand on that and we want to uh, grow that but that side of the business is very experimental right now it's just us testing and seeing what works and what doesn't and and um kind of feeling it out we do believe though that content like you said mixing it into the business side of things we've done that with clients before um and either you know consulted on how they should be creating content or created content for them with them um and content is very important right now it's 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 broad you have to be broad so many people back in our day when we started again uh, the industry changing was like if you have a twitch and a youtube you're good yep that's it you, and maybe twitter to promote yourself you're golden um no now you need to be on tiktok now you need to be on instagram now you need to be on facebook you need to be in all of these places do you need to be live streaming all of them no but what are you going to do on that platform to make your content unique and different so people a your current audience has to go over there to experience something that they're not experiencing on platform a and b how are you going to draw people from that platform into uh whatever your main income source is or, or your main platform so um you have to think long and hard the yep. industry has changed and things are different it's not the same and that's how we look at it we we don't look at it as a money maker we actually look at a lot of what we do as a marketing vehicle for other stuff we do so you know if, if star wars and scotch can it, it, it get the broader Star Wars community to come to GCX. It's a successful show. Oh, That's the way we look at it. I can. Um, it if it makes money, great. I'm I'm <laughs> super happy about that. Like yeah. awesome. Why not? Yeah, but you can't look at it as you know. I'm going to make a million dollars off my podcast this year. I yeah. think you're setting yourself up for nothing but failure at that point. But um, uh, at this on the same token, if you have a podcast that gets you know 500 listens per week. Do not judge yourself based on, you know, how many listens Mark Marin's podcast gets because you will also set yourself up for failure. 500 is a lot of people. It is, yeah. And you can do a lot with 500 people. So don't be discouraged by the fact that you don't have as many listens or views or impressions as these other folks. Gauge it based on what it what it is and 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 know the market and and rise above it. I remember I negotiated my first sponsorship deal as a broadcaster myself. And I was averaging, I think I was 66 CCV at the time. Yeah. And um, uh, I was part time. I was only streaming like 15 to 20 hours a week. And I, I managed to get a couple hundred dollars a month out of them because they wanted, you know, we'll send you free product. Well, that doesn't, you know, yeah. that doesn't put gas in my car and put groceries on the table for my kids. So, um, I, you know, I, I, I would like cash instead of the free product or in addition to. Um, and you can do that. And there's a lot of brands out there that will play ball with you. Um, you know, don't go in hot with ludicrous amounts, but you know, be smart, learn the industry, understand what what um, what your value is, and um, you know, there will always be opportunities that you should take for free. I I, I don't yeah. think that's absolute either, but know your value on some things that you know you should definitely uh, uh, be paid for them uh, if you have the impressions, but. Um, our, yeah, our content is, 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 you know, we love April Fool's. I think we kill it every April Fool's personally. <laughs> um, uh, and then uh, we have our vlog, uh, which has become more infrequent just because um, when COVID hit, it was boring. So we kind of suspended it. And now, you know, the vlog is a lot of, we just try and do special moments. So we might change the format of it in the future to just kind of document special things instead of like a weekly or monthly or right. biweekly vlog. Um, and then um, we are going to get back into gaming stuff after GCX. We have it on the calendar. It's coming. It's happening. Um, just getting through planning an event through a pandemic and everything has not allowed as much time. Right. But again, letting go and like I said earlier, and being able to shift back to things that you know were beneficial to us in the past. That's what we need to get back to and get back to our roots. So. Um, yeah, con content is, is, is king and yep. it, it always has been, it's just keep up with how it's created and where you're putting it. And, you know, 
like one, one, one of my favorite examples of content, we hired him to uh, do GCX stuff for this year is Flawless. Are you familiar? I'm with very him? familiar. Yeah. Love Flawless. The dude, the dude is a very successful Twitch streamer. He's a Twitch partner. He averages around hundred viewers. He slays it on TikTok. Kills slays it. it. And you have to go to TikTok to get that side yep. of his content. You're not getting that on Twitch. Don't get me wrong. He does his characters and everything on Twitch and his transitions are ridiculous. Yep. But what you get on TikTok is not what you get on Twitch. So you have to follow him on both platforms and stay up if you really want to get the full effect of who Flawless is as a creator. So that's it. You know, that, that, that's how I see it. And, you know, then you have innovative creators like Umezi who are, are freestyling, you know, while they're raiding yeah. in, in, in WoW. And then you have, you know, sweaty people like Leopard who are trying to, <laughs> you know, be the best ever. So make sure, you know, that you're putting your content where it makes sense, yeah. but diversify like D flawless, make it different on every platform. So you have that cross pollination back Absolutely. and forth. Well, we only have time for a couple more questions, uh, but I, I do, I think it's important that, you know, as the industry grows and, and more students, uh, you know, are, are entering the sector of gaming and esports after graduation, what, what sort of advice would you give them as they start their journeys into these industries? Um, one thing that I told someone recently, and they said it was super profound, so I'll repeat it here, especially for uh, students at Full Sail, is there's no shame in being back of house. And I think that Full Sail as a whole is, is predicated on that. In fact, you should probably take a lot of pride in being back of house. As someone who's been both, I prefer back of house <laughs> over front of house. Um, I, I, I love situations like this where we get to talk and, and have a conversation. Um, I do not like getting up on stage at GCX and having to, uh, you know, address everyone and say, thank you. It's just not my thing. Um, but I loved when we did, um, the, uh, uh, the, what was it before COVID when I came out to full sale and did, the, uh, we did the, uh, panel the panel for hall of fame. Yeah. That was amazing. You know, I love that stuff, but it takes someone doing the AV for that. It takes someone, you know, running the camera, it takes all of those. So, and those skill sets are invaluable and they're going to take you to places you never imagined. I have a friend who's a sound engineer. He lives in upstate New York. He is hired by some of the biggest companies in Hollywood. And he's like, hey, I'm in Nepal this week doing, you know. Yeah. And, and he's a sound engineer. Yeah. He owns all of his own equipment. So he gets hired as a contractor. You know, I'm in the Philippines, blah, blah, blah. You never know where it's going to take you. So be proud to do back of house. You do not need to be the one in front of the camera uh, all the time um, and, and do that. But the, the other big thing, and this is what I learned, is don't be afraid to change your mind. Um you know, when I went to uh, five towns and I studied audio recording technology, that was my, that was it. Like I had an in it bad boy. I was going to go, you know, intern at bad boy. Uh, and that was it. I was going to be, you know, mixing for P Diddy at some point. That's right. where I was in my head. You know, that's it. Like I'm, I'm, you know, I'm going to be hanging out in the studio with, with, with the bad boy crew. It's going to be great. It's, it's that. And, you know, a year later, that was no longer the case. Um, uh, so don't be afraid to change yeah. um, and and really follow your heart. Do not, do not, do not try and think overly pragmatic about things because your heart tends to lead you in the right place when it comes to career paths. Yeah. Um, if I didn't follow my heart, I would not be sitting here. If I didn't take a chance and try streaming, you know, it wouldn't have led to all yeah. this other stuff where I could tap into my event planning experience, you know, my business experience, financial mark, like all of that stuff would never have happened if I didn't go like, uh, and try that. And I, I'll add this one more thing. If I didn't have my wife on board for that journey, yeah. and you know this, it wouldn't work. Like yep. I had to say, babe, I need to try this because I don't want to look back in 10 years and regret that I didn't. So please give me grace to try this. And we put a time limit on it. And we said, if it didn't work, we we're going to call it quits. And here I am about what about seven years later. Yeah. Change your life completely. <laughs> it completely. <laughs> And it's, it's those little, it's those little moments that, you know, Hey, I'm going to do this thing. And it, and it, and it happens in it. And, and it doesn't always work out how you, you planned it, like you said, and, no. but you, you're able to pivot in the right moments and, and take things to, to the next level. Well, before the last question, I do want to give you some chance to just kind of a tell people where to find you, uh, what, when GCX is, how to come, sure. how to, you know, all, all the things. Yeah. Uh, uh, GCX is June 11th and 12th at Rosen Shingle Creek in Orlando, Florida. Um, come down. It is a great networking opportunity. I can't emphasize that enough. Um, uh, 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 some of the biggest industry folks are there and they're just walking around the floor. And the reason is they like our event because they don't get bothered. It's small. It's not PAX. It's not E3. 
it's you know it's it's a smaller event where they can kind of be free to look and talk and and do what they want so if you're looking to make connections and meet people gcx is definitely one of the places to be and it's the most fun event in all of video games so uh -huh. uh, but yeah gcx event.com uh, uh, uh and it's june 11th and 12th at rosen shingle creek in orlando uh king's coast we're dropping cold brew tomorrow I'm for, so uh, for darkness so uh king's coast coffee.com for another cold brew batch but um uh, uh if you want to chat with me I'm not really online that much anymore. I'm not going <laughs> to lie, but it's Kevin X vision on Twitter. If you'd like to see like all the cool things I retweet and talk about. Uh, um, and then uh, it's K magic one one on, on uh, Instagram. Everything else I do is under rare drop. <clears throat> so you can go to rare drop .co, um, and uh, you know, learn about us there. Check out some of our shows. All our socials are there. We have a discord. Uh, we have a pretty uh, engaged community. Um, we have a, a probably the best part of our discord is the spoiler chat so the second you go see like a marvel movie or something yeah. you can hop in there and you can find the people that you want to talk to about it um because that's the one the one room in our discord where it's off like if you don't want to if you don't want something spoiled don't go yeah. in there because yep. they're talking about it so um you can join the discord and, and, and hop in there but um yeah raredrop.co is is pretty much where you'll find everything we're working on awesome very cool all right for the final question what do you see the future of gaming conventions in in like the next five years like what's going to happen what's going to change i think smaller events are you're always going to have your pax west and your pax east right. they're not going anywhere i think e3 is dead i don't think it's coming back rip um yeah I, I really don't because a lot of these studios realize they don't need e3 to get their marketing uh pushes out um i do think that a lot of these studios are going to start supporting smaller events to um um uh, add on to their marketing push because it's like probably a one to one to 10 spend on based on what they were spending at E3. Um, so um, yeah, I think smaller events are going to be key. I think community events are going to be huge. I think you're going to start seeing these like two to 10,000 person events popping up all over the place. Um, and I think that's where esports stuff will be held as well. And I think you're going to see a merging of a lot of different types of gaming. You know, this is the first year that we're diving headfirst into tabletop card yeah. games and D and D we have a whole room dedicated to it. Dungeon masters on site. Like you will be able to book a session for four hours and hang out with your friends and play some D and D. That's awesome. Um, and PAX has been doing it for forever and it's yeah. super successful for them. So, um, I think you're going to just start to see a lot of the melding of gaming and what it means to be a gamer and those walls are going to start to crumble and those community events are going to get bigger um not too big where it's packs but bigger because they're going to start right. banding together because a lot of i spoke to a ton of event organizers over this whole time and my my messaging was always like we should work together we should do joint promo codes we should do this so yep. we're working with jabali from ceo he'll be at gcx um and you know we'll have a table at daytona ceo um talking about gcx so you know, you're going to see a lot of that where events are coming. There's another event uh, you, you got in Orlando next week. You got PodFest and VidFest. Yep. You know, the folks who run that um, as well. So um, you're going to start seeing more of, of the coming together, the walls breaking down on what it means to be a gamer and content creation because those PodFest and VidFest stuff that comes into our industry that plays in the same court we play in. So, you know, start to embrace that. And, you know, find events that are hosting stuff that you're interested in. And, you know, when the, when it becomes more diverse, I feel like you're going to start to meet new people and find new interests and see new things that you didn't know you liked. Yeah, absolutely. You discover a whole new area of, of something that you're, you know, oh, this is a new thing I'm into now. So I didn't know I like tabletop RPGs until we got locked inside. <laughs> exactly right. <laughs> now i do oh that's awesome well kevin thank you so much for being here and and being a guest on have game will travel i i truly appreciate it and uh our very next guest is going to be i am brandon on june 9th at 5 p.m definitely come on by for that one um and uh if you're watching this on youtube don't forget to hit like comment and subscribe we will see you later thanks again thank you